Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, everybody. Today, we're talking to Shannon Cohn, who is a documentary filmmaker and women's health ambassador who created and directed a film called Below the Belt, which is a documentary all about endometriosis. So welcome to the show, Shannon. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, we appreciate your time because we know you're very busy. And Bridget and I were lucky enough to get to see the documentary in Nashville when they did a filming. And it was a very emotionally poignant documentary about four women who struggle with endometriosis. I thought maybe we could start, and I know it's a topic close to your heart as well. Mm -hmm. I thought we could start with, if you could just explain to our audience what women go through, what endometriosis Mm -hmm. is and what women are going through with it. Sure. So I I always say that endometriosis is arguably the most common devastating disease that most people have never heard of. Uh, it affects 10 to 15 percent of reproductive age women. And um, wow, I mean, so many of the stats are kind of all mind boggling and um, outrageous. For example, uh, people usually go to eight doctors over 10 years before they even hear, hear the word endometriosis, even though they have usually present with classic symptoms. Um, it puts a burden on society in the US uh, to the tune of 116 billion, and that's with a B, dollars each year and lost productivity, lost wages and associated medical costs. It's the cause of up to 50% of infertility in women. And the, the real injustice there is a lot of that is needless because of a lot of the hurdles that are in place with cultural hurdles, you know, and taboo and stigma, something that you guys know about and people don't wanna talk about women's issues. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, um, institutional hurdles, financial hurdles, um, where women often uh, are disproportionately relegated to subpar treatments because maybe the research hasn't been there. So there aren't a lot of great treatments available uh, for a certain condition. Uh, or, you know, you go through the merry go round of doctor's offices and tests chasing symptoms. Um, and really having no one there to kind of just put the picture together and say, wait a second, let's stop this and let's just find the answer. You have all of these, let's don't do these, you know, 20 other tests that cost you thousands of dollars. Let's put it together and, and, um, go for the answer, which I'm sure a lot of your viewers, just that, that general kind of, uh, you know, journey is common a lot of women's health conditions. Um, I know with menopause symptoms, uh, you know, it's that constant chasing of the symptom rather than it's difficult to find the provider who's gonna say, oh, it's menopause first. (laughs) Rather than let's chase that symptom, let's chase this symptom. Um, Yeah, and you know, it was amazing when we went to see Below the Belt, how long it takes to get an accurate diagnosis. Can you share how long that is? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I can share first anecdotally, like I first had symptoms of endometriosis when I was 16, yet I did not hear the word until I was 29 years old, despite you know, presenting as a teenager with debilitating periods, like really disruptive GI symptoms, which a lot of people don't know that a lot of people with endometriosis actually present with GI symptoms first, even before painful periods. So if you have a daughter or friend, niece, whomever, who's a teenager, and she mentions often that she's having stomach aches, uh, your radar should go up because that's not normal to have those cyclical stomach aches that may be debilitating. Um, And so basically, like so many others, uh, you know, we see it takes an average of 10 years before people are diagnosed with endometriosis. And that includes a lot of symptoms being dismissed. Uh, or, I mean, I, for one, was told that it's just part of being a woman, suck it up, you know, like you're going to have painful periods, or uh, that I um, was overreacting, or I was trying to get attention. And I remember thinking as a 16 year old, I was like, what is this person talking about? Like, I know how to get attention. I'm a teenager, you know, like, (laughs) I would never like, 
it would never be my plan to try to get attention about complaining from pain from my girl parts. <laughs> you know, yeah, I just right. thinking that like this doesn't make any sense. And I mean, now we have the term for it, which is gaslighting. But I mean, yes, that's yeah, often. Yeah. And another aspect, um, which Colleen and I were very lucky, thanks to her MD for sponsoring Below the Belt in Nashville, uh, to go beforehand. And we met some of the researchers from Vanderbilt. And, you know, we're trying to figure out causes. Why is this happening to women? And I remember we talked to two of the um, researchers uh, at Vanderbilt, and they mentioned something about Agent Orange being a possibility. Do you have any idea of any causes? why this is happening. Yeah. I mean, that I don't know anything about that. Um, and I can't speak to any specific research study. I, I look at it kind of all in a, in a, in a large um, scale, like understanding. So I'm not a researcher. Uh, so that disclaimer, I mean, there is a lot of research that shows that potentially environmental and endocrine disruptors play a role in endometriosis and a lot of diseases you know, cancers for sure. Um, and honestly, it's kind of common sense. Like when you have chemicals in our environment and they're not really supposed to be there and they're man-made and synthetic and all of a sudden you're putting it on our bodies, you know, in our bodies, you're ingesting it. It's probably not a natural, uh, you know, occurrence. Like something's probably going to be changed there. Uh, and there is, you know, research that, um, and I can't cite it all right now, but that there's something there, you know, to that. I don't think it's just that. And they, there is research that shows that there is a genetic link, uh, a seven times increased risk uh, among sisters and between mothers and daughters. So there's definitely something going on there. Uh, we know that um, the immune system plays a role in some way or it's triggered in some way. And there, there is research where, um, let's see, they did autopsies on uh, fetuses and nine to 10% of those fetuses already had endometriosis. So clearly no menstruation yet. There's not any type of, a lot of, a lot of people say, oh, it's retrograde menstruation. And this is based on this hundred year old research study, by the way, that's completely inaccurate. Um, that, and that's kind of really derailed the entire research paradigm of endometriosis where people are just trying to stop periods. And with the idea that if you stop periods, Periods, then endometriosis goes away, but unfortunately, that's just not the case. Um, so, yeah, we need uh, we need more research. We we need more research funding in women's health, but specifically for endometriosis in a really robust amount, so that we can start to understand, you know, what is actually causing this. And until we find those answers, we can't actually find. This is the way these are targeted treatments that aren't a sledgehammer, uh, you know, where you're knocking out all of the hormones in a woman's body. And like that leads obviously to a whole host of other problems. And it's not natural. But until we have that research funding to, you know, develop those targeted therapies, targeted treatments, a sledgehammer is what we're working with in a lot of ways. My understanding with endometriosis is that tissue that is similar to the lining of your uterus actually grows outside your uterus and can actually spread to other organs. And I think that's one of the things that women really do not know is that it can actually be located in other organs. So when they go to the emergency room or they go to their doctor, very rarely are there treatments available for them that are going to cover the entire body. You did talk on in the documentary about a procedure that was done for women that was one, not covered by insurance, but two, really was life-changing for, I believe, two of the women um, on the show. Can you talk about what that procedure was and, and what it's doing for women? Sure. Well, first of all, I'll say that endometriosis has now been found in every organ in the body every organ, the spleen, the brain, the lungs, the diaphragm, the liver. I mean, it's not relegated to the pelvic cavity. I mean, there are cases where women, like women's lungs have collapsed during their periods or they can't breathe because it's on their diaphragm. I know people who have like, can't see because it was in their eye. Like, wow. you know, it, people just don't realize, you know, the, the systemic effect and the locations that endometriosis can be. And as far as the treatment, I mean, really, I will say we highlight a type of surgery called excision surgery, which is where um, 
a surgeon who is well-trained goes in, in surgery and actually cuts the endometriosis out. And it really makes sense for people who don't understand. Like when, if you have cancer and you have tumors, do you want a surgeon to go in and cut that tumor out? Or do you want them to have the skill to kind of go in with a laser and burn what they can see? Never knowing for sure, for sure, if they're getting the entire tumor, because you can't see it. You're not actually cutting it. You're just burning the spots that you see. And it's that same, you know, that's called ablation surgery. And the, the issue is that the vast majority of the 60,000 OBGYNs in this country, they only can do ablation surgery. The skill set has just not been developed. It hasn't been prioritized. You know, there are good people trying to do a good job, but most of their time is going to be delivering babies. Maybe they do hysterectomies. They do other, they treat fibro, they treat other women's health conditions. But I think we need to get to a situation where People who, women who need endometriosis surgery, the OBGYNs aren't trying to do it. You know, they're just understanding that this needs to be referred. Like if you had cancer and you needed to see an oncologist, then you're going to be referred. You know, you're not, you're, your general practitioner is not going to try to do cancer surgery on you. So we need to get to a situation where women with endo are referred to specialist surgeons. And just a quick side note, excision surgery is the first step in a multidisciplinary treatment um, paradigm. It's a key first step. Like, cause I mean, intuitively, like if you don't, if you have a tumor in your body, how can you start to heal if the tumor is there or part of the tumor is there? You gotta get it out. So you got to cut it out, but then only then can your body actually start to heal and that inflammatory process can go down and you have to really support it with a lot of like really good nutritional choices, like eating an anti-inflammatory diet, figuring out what your triggers are. Like for me, I love sugar. Who doesn't love sugar? I mean, I'm, come on. okay. My husband doesn't love sugar, but I mean, I'm like, I don't understand. I love anyway. what? <laughs> <laughs> he likes salt, but I'm like sugar. Hello. I like both. But, <laughs> like both. I, I, no, I love it all. I love it all. But like, I really have noticed like, oh, as much as I hate it, like I noticed if I don't eat sugar, I feel better. You know, like my joints are better. Like I exercise better. I have more energy. Of course, if I'm going to a wedding or a birthday party, I'm, I'm going to have a piece of cake. <laughs> That's like my thing. But I've noticed, you know, if I really cut back on things like sugar, it helps a lot. And I think a lot of people this, it's not a magic bullet, the surgery. You really have to think about your body as a whole and support it. Maybe it does mean some medications. Like I can share that I actually manage, help continue manage symptoms because I have an IUD. It doesn't work for everyone, but it works for me. And it's really being open to, you know, it's kind of like a mosaic of treatment and finding out which of those tiles are for you. You know, you can discount the ones that aren't for you, but the ones that are, um, you know, yeah. You gotta, you gotta explore them. It's, you know, watching that movie, it was, I mean, I think the whole theater was had tears in their eyes when we were finished watching it because you saw the situations of these women and what they were going through and the number of doctors in the United States or probably worldwide, it's very limited that can do this surgery. And then to watch the women that were maxing out credit cards in order to pay for it or, or their parents maxing their out parents them. um second mortgage mortgaging their homes so that their daughter his daughter could have this surgery and how hard it was can you talk about how limited uh the availability is to yeah. do this surgery yeah you know the medical system is just set up it, it's difficult to navigate when you need treatment that you think, I mean, that we're seeing anecdotal and we're seeing research, by the way, that excision does work. I mean, the, the, the official party line of the establishment is like, there's not enough research. There is research, you know, they just have to be open to the research and they have to read the research and listen to it from reputable sources. It's there. And that body of research is growing and hopefully we'll meet that critical mass so that finally we get some people saying, okay. But at the same time, you know, when it doesn't really benefit certain people, you know, like it's easy to kind of say, no, 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 not, not yet. Cause that's not really convenient, but you know, we're, I think we'll, I'm, I'm positive and hopeful that we'll get to that point, but, um, Oh, you know, it's complicated. There are a lot of institutional hurdles that we all face with healthcare. Like healthcare is so expensive in this country. 
like you know i remember if you if, if taylor um all i'm sorry tatum also who runs the music health alliance there in nashville like her, the nonprofit that connects healthcare with people in the music industry you know one of the if not the most common cause of bankruptcy in america are health bills like yes. what does that say about all of us and how what i mean how i'm sure how much anxiety do we all face that we're going to face like a catastrophic illness and how would we actually how would we actually pay for the treatment um, so an endometriosis is part and parcel of that to access that treatment. I will say there are excision surgeons who do take insurance. It's harder to find them. Um, and that you don't always have to go out of network. They are, there are a lot of them at, um, academic hospital, like teaching hospitals. And, uh, I will say a great place to start if someone's like, how do I even find that on, on Facebook, there's a, a big group of like almost 200,000 patients called Nancy's Nook endometriosis education. And they actually keep uh, a running list of people who do excision surgery. I think it's a great place to start. Do you have to be relegated to that list? No. It's a great place to start to understand, okay, these are a list of surgeons in this country and around the world who have been vetted to a certain extent and say that they do excision surgery. But that's it, you know, I don't know if you, I don't know if you just heard what I said, but it's like, they say they do excision surgery. So the patient, you know, the onus is on the patient to ask the questions to the surgeon. How many of the excision surgeons do you do every month, you know? Are, are you, how many do you do, like if it's in my diaphragm or if it's in different parts of the body, do you do, um, do you believe in a multidisciplinary treatment regimen? You know, like ask those hard questions. And if anything that surgeon says to you raises, like, you know, you, we all have that internal instinct for all of this, you know, and like, you've got to listen to it with endometriosis because, you know, repeat surgeries are a common occurrence and they make things worse. Uh, Cause then you're dealing with scar tissue and adhesions and all of the things that none of us want to deal with. Through your research and doing the documentary, did you come across any research on the menopausal woman who has now, you know, her estrogen no longer is an issue for her, but the tissue still exists. Are they still struggling with endometriosis? Yes. I mean, that's, that's a misconception that when you, and that's another thing that women here in doctor's offices, you know, usually, oh, well you get pregnant or you have a hysterectomy or you got the menopause, it'll all go away. Like you're, you're almost there, like, hang on, you know, that's not necessarily true. Yes, it can. And symptoms can improve, you know, but they can worsen too and they can persist. Um, there are plenty, there's plenty of research out there that shows that menopausal women have endometriosis symptoms. I believe some of the, the research, like women in their eighties have had endometriosis symptoms. So we're not talking about, you know, a disease of women in their twenties, thirties, and forties. No, it can absolutely persist. Yes. And you know, the, the documentary was just so helpful too, just following, um, different patients and then Congress, they got Congress involved. So can you share a little bit about ha what happened as a result of that? Yes, thank you. So we have been working with, uh, we worked with Senator Orrin Hatch and Senator Elizabeth Warren since 2017 to you know, work on different policy goals in Washington, DC, as well as generate research funding from the Department of Defense for the first time in history in fiscal year 2018. And Senator Hatch retired in 2019 and then Mitt Romney took his place on the Republican side because we believe it's incredibly important to remain carefully bipartisan. This is a human issue, not a political issue. You. It's something that both sides of the aisle could and should get behind because it affects everyone, you know. So um, we've been working, we screened the film for members of Congress in March 1st of this year on Capitol Hill. That screening was co-hosted by Mitt Romney and Elizabeth Warren, where we announced a five-point action plan to move forward in a substantive way to actually Use the film, I always say that the film is a catalyzing tool for change. If we can change hearts and minds, we can change policy. And that's the goal with the film, to bring these conversations, to bring these stakeholders together, to touch their hearts, to touch their minds, so that then they're, they're open to say, all right, I'm a person who has this platform, or I have this ability, or I have this audience, what can I do? And then we're like, okay, here's what you can do. <laughs> yes. And we have that, we have that ready for them. Uh, and that's made, has made, and is making a big difference. 
along with the representatives in Congress, you had executive producers mm -hmm. like Hillary Clinton, Rosario Dawson, Corinne mm -hmm. Fox, and Mae Whitman. Those are big names in Hollywood. And now Bindi Irwin just posted that she had endometriosis. And you're getting more uh, well-known names out there talking about the topic. So hopefully women will become more aware and educated. But what a woman who thinks she might have endometriosis and she goes to the doctor, what are, what's kind of the first question she wants to ask them? What should she ask for to get a diagnosis? Yeah. Um, I would always say, keep a journal of your symptoms. You know, I, people say that and it kind of sounds tedious, even for me. I'm like, Oh, I don't want to keep a journal. That's like something else to write or keep up with. But I have learned just because of successive doctor's offices and tests, it really does make a difference. So first, just be prepared when you go in and um, treat your healthcare provider as a partner. Don't put them on a pedestal, you know, like educate yourself, become empowered and just say, listen, have you considered that endometriosis could be cause of these symptoms? Can we explore that? And if you have a journal and say, you know, you can show them like, this is when I've had these symptoms. And if they, if it starts looking cyclical, all those symptoms of endo can be anytime during the month, but a lot of times they skew cyclical. Um, and then really explore that with the healthcare provider. Typically they're going to say, let's take some painkillers first. So let's try some, you know, birth control pills or other hormonal treatments. I think it's okay, depending on the goals of the patient, you know, it's really about individualized care. Um, is the patient 15, you know, like is the patient 35, right? Is fertility a goal, you know, or, or are they just trying to get through college? You know, like, are they trying, do they have a goal of six months and they're just trying to get through graduation? Depending on the life circumstance, I think that really informs the treatment paradigm. Uh, but if symptoms persist, I think probably, you know, a surgery for right now for what we know is going to need to be in that person's future. And as Dr. Iris Orbuck says in the film, like endometriosis should not be the path of 15 surgeries. It should be one surgery done right. And that's the key. Um, so that when a woman goes in and she thinks um, that that could be it, that she asks those questions. If the doctor says, I think we should do surgery or like make sure that they're not going to just look that, that no, that they're going to treat that. If they find something, they're going to treat it at the same time. And they have the skills to treat it. And that's when the questions come in. How often do you do these surgeries? You know, what's your, like, tell me more about your outcomes. Tell me about where you've operated, which organs do you work with a multidisciplinary team? Because research is showing that even with endometriosis specialists, if they bring in general surgeons, surgeons who work, for example, in the bowel often, we're seeing better outcomes after surgery. It takes a team. Yeah. It's complicated. I know I'm thrilled. Yeah. Out no, there. Yeah. We, we but it's so it. interesting. It's so, it, yeah, yeah are just really helpful because that's, Amazing to hear about, well, what type of surgeon and that surgeon that works in the bowel. Okay. That's what you're looking for. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, the, and the main thing, and I'm sure a lot of people listening is like in today's age, we have to be our own advocates because people are busy. I mean, the talk, doctors see you for a few minutes, you know, and they go on to their next patient and their next 10 to 20 patients in a day, you know? So as much as they care, and I, like I said, doctors are, I think are overwhelmingly good people trying to do a good job. The systems in place are not on your side. So you have to be your advocate. You have to be, you know, educate yourself and not be afraid to speak up, you know, because at the end of the day, it's your, it's your body, it's your life. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Shannon, for coming yeah. on the show. We, we will have the links to all the information in the show notes, including Nancy's note, because I think that will be really helpful mm -hmm. for a lot of women listening to this podcast. But thank you for doing Below the Belt, for getting the yes. work out on endometriosis. Yeah. And thank you for spending time with us today. Of course. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you.